stuff like that. So sometimes it's not really their fault. It can be like peer pressure, and the teacher shouldn't pick on them because of that. A group of friends cannot become a family. It cannot take the place of a mother and a father and all of the things that get learned in that environment as well. Kids feel disconnected from school because they're disconnected from the self, disconnected from their own creative processes. And they think that the, the ones not so smart can't keep up anyway, so if they're not going to try any harder, then they might as well not even help. But they're the ones that really need help. The uh, public school is not really a setup are run by people who are prepared uh, to deal with diversity. And all the people that love him are girls and all the people that hate him are guys. <laughs> Is there some He's kind of sexist. Like... He's so sexist. Uh, he yeah. picks on guys and, and uh, favors girls a lot. I was in the class, but now I'm out. <laughs> well, in my case, I'm still in the class. And he doesn't, he doesn't really uh, pick on me like he did them, I guess. He, I, can, I can tell the favorism though. He likes all the, all the girls, and all the girls like him, I guess. <laughs> the day I transferred out of his class, I had him come up and sign my paper to transfer, transfer slip. And um, he came down and he, and he dropped my pen, and he, and he just said, pick it up. And so I did, and I came down and picked it up, and he stepped on it, and then he slapped me up in the butt. And then I came out and said, what was that for? And he goes, you don't talk back to me, and he slapped me in the face. <laughs> and stuff like that, and he, and he, and he called, and he call me all kinds of like, like swear words and stuff. That's a bad teacher, because I don't think there's any need for that. And I think if they, I, they think they, I think they think that kids nowadays, they think that we're all bad kids and we don't care about learning, but we, you know we do, and and we'll t we'll give the teachers respect if they give us respect. I didn't learn anything. I don't think I learned anything at all. Public schools. I learned you know, a lot of things from reading books, but I really don't, don't feel I learned you know, anything really of value there. I, mean, I think public schools are notoriously bad. And, and, and I would repeat that I think that they are bad in part because of the interference of politicians in them. The kindergarten teacher was resentful that I would bring to her a student that already knew how to read. She said, what am I supposed to teach him? As though I had committed some kind yeah. of a crime. And uh, in and, and he was always punished because he couldn't sit still and listen to children learning their alphabet letters. And so there was no exception made for a child who needed to be a self-paced learner. You have a formulaic way of teaching kids and you, you, you employ it for every kid and you employ it systematically and all teachers are on the same page. It doesn't matter who the kids are. My impression of a teacher is, you know, what they do, they, they come out here and they, um, you know, there's one test for you, one test for you, and do them. I'll be doing crossword puzzles, and I don't know this stuff myself, but I'm giving it to you because I have an answer book here. Mm -hmm. And um, you just memorize the stuff for the test. You take the test, you forget the material. So, you know what it is. You get an A. Mm -hmm. You say, look, I got an A, and I, for I can forget it. Mm -hmm. Students who do well on standardized tests don't necessarily understand Mm -hmm. what the tests say they understand. We've gone in, for example, and interviewed students who have done well on, on these standardized tests, and we asked them a little bit of probing questions about the concepts and about the meaning of what they're doing. Uh, it's very disappointing. That's how you stop learning. You stop learning when you take in knowledge as if someone else can give it to you and put it in your head. Educators used to look upon learning as memorization or as in a very behavioristic viewpoint, stimulus response. Uh, now we're beginning to understand much more the complexity of learning and realize that there's sort of a, a phrase that students must construct their own understanding, that, that knowledge of mathematics has to be deep and that you construct that through work and interaction and thinking and trial and error and making mistakes and talking to other students and to teachers. You have to make mistakes. You can't learn without that. Um, and if you're allowed to make mistakes and acknowledge those mistakes, you learn from them, you won't make them again. I found brilliant students who were classified as slow learners in mathematics. Um, they weren't being recognized. They were, they were bored with arithmetic, but when I gave them some algebraic subjects to explore or geometric subjects, they excelled. Uh, they got excited and they showed how excited they were. 
the way I managed to teach was to say there are problems we need to solve and let's work on it together. And in a group of people working on difficult texts, we could work effectively together. And I think I learned a lot about Milton from my students, working with my students, and I assume they learned too. But I could trust that teaching because there was a sense in which no one was doing teaching. That is, we were all there as active learners. I need to stay in touch with my own creative self. If I'm involved in a process of teaching a creative process, then I must understand that process better all the time. So I'm at workshops, and I'm at in-services, and I'm taking class, and I'm learning from my students every day. And we talk about how this is a, a shared teaching situation. Students have things to teach, too. They ask questions I never would have thought of asking that are important questions that I have forgotten about or never would have dreamed about um, because they come from uh, other perspectives that are part of what we should be asking and looking at. If I weren't listening carefully to my students, I mean, how can you have a dialogue with someone if you're not listening carefully to them? So the idea that teaching can take place without real dialogue going on, without listening really carefully to someone, is silly. Don't think too much. This is a very um, spontaneous uh, uh, kind of working. It's like a dance. You and the paint. You and the paint and your intuitions. You and the paint and what you know that you know, what you know that you don't know that you know yet. Your wise blood. The creative spirit is about joining. It's about having an imagination. It's about connecting. And so finding something in the self to be joyful about, so finding something in the self to celebrate, and then recognizing it in someone else and joining with someone else is, is the heart of, of living. How many of you have experienced this? I know something more than I knew before, but I'm not sure I can tell you what it is yet. Yeah. I think a great teacher attends to what their students need and gives them what they need when they need it. Right now my sense is what the painting is telling me is you're really focused here and you haven't seen, you haven't seen this space around her head yet as anything that's really part of, of, of where the head exists or why it's existing. So now think about what hue, what color have you used here that you could echo into the background that would give you a place to build from, realizing that you could change it later if you need to. Not, e not each teacher can go around and help everybody with their certain problem. Let's say you don't get the math then, and you want help, but you have your hand up for like, t like 20 minutes. And he's going around, I'll be there in a second. He can't do it all. Our local district was found out of compliance with the class size proportion of teacher to student ratio over three years in a row now. We have like 40 kids in one of our classes, 42, in, in our second period class, and there's no way the teacher can get to all of them. The class sizes are way too large. The statistics have been there since the 60s that anything over the class size of 24 lecturing the most ineffective method of teaching is just about all you can do. And um, the teachers are overburdened with um, a, a, dis a description, a job description that they can't accomplish because there's too many bodies in the classroom. A lot of times there's not enough desks for all the kids, so like so many kids will have to stand or, or like and, and so when we take a test and other people they have to like, they don't have a desk to sit down and write on so they either have to stand up and write on a wall or something. <laughs> And so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And we need to get down and, and cut down the class size for one. That's a major, major issue. I mean, I, for you people just uh, moving around here, it's a difficulty. You bump into desks. I bump into desks 